Hello, everybody. Good morning. I hate Mondays, honestly. Manuel, you're there too? Hello, Kay. Hey, to you, Amir. Well, Manuel says he, he can't hear us. I'll tell him to maybe relog. Hello, finally. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. There he is. Yeah, somehow that dialogue, uh, whether I want to join with my computer audio, vanished and didn't come back. I can so, figure out, uh, Jürgen, are you German or English? Your first name is German, your last name is English. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, my heritage is Norwegian. Um, and there's oh, okay. a long story about how our last name came to be, um, something about immigration and whatnot, so. Okay, okay, thanks yeah. for letting me know. <laughs> Because uh, Manuel speaks German and I, and I lived in Germany for a long time and I didn't know if we could talk to you in German. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't understand a word, I think. Oh, no problem. Sorry, Manuel, I'm taking your spotlight. No, no, I think we're still uh, leaving some time for people to join. Oh, we have a lot, a lot of news for KubeCon North America, right? Yeah, I think and, Ricardo is on vacation, so he might join next time. Great. So yeah, let's get started. Um, so community question time. Are there any questions before we start? If not, then uh, our first agenda topic is KubeCon, uh, which is approaching fast. And we have a lot of presence there. So we have booked office hours. Um, last time we already had these uh, two slots, 45 minutes uh, each. And uh, we discussed a little bit. They are still um, reschedulable, but I think by now all the slots might have gone. Um, so we have one on Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, and another one on Thursday, 3 p.m. Uh, I think it's not that bad, given that the event starts on Tuesday, people might be in um, zero co uh, day co-located events. And Friday is the last day, so a lot of people cannot pay attention anymore. Uh, so having these two slots are, are really great. Also Wednesday at 10 a.m., that's before the um, keynote talks. Uh, which start at noon. And then the Thursday one, um, uh, yeah, I, I chose that because anyways, this is going to be a busy day um, with all the talks. Um, so I, I, have a, I have a talk there and um, so I selected this one as personal preference. Is everybody okay with these slots or should we uh, go and look if we find another one? Uh, I think there was an email sent today that today is the last day to pick them. So <laughs> let's just keep them for now to not lose them, maybe. I don't know, unless there is objection. Okay, about the uh, office hours staffing, I think to me and myself will be there. Um, and then they depending on how we, yeah, we should all be there, right? <laughs> Why not? Um, depending on how, what we want to um, 
put in there. Uh, so for KubeCon Europe, um, everybody who was attending these office hours sort of was expecting something to be presented. Um, there were only a few that I saw. So I joined a few project uh, discussions and a few actually had discussions going on. Um, but mostly it was one way presentation. And yeah, maybe uh, we can uh, redo one of the deep dives that we're currently planning. Maybe we have a new one up by then. Or if anybody wants to present something in the project pavilion, um, please feel free to say you have an implementation and do it there. Um, so I'm taking applications um, <laughs> until KubeCon. And the next point is the project boost. So here it would be, I understand, a little bit more difficult to uh, place an implementation of our specification because this should not be about products. Uh, this is only for our project being uh, CNCF hosted uh, open source project. And we need stuffing. I started a table, but I, I don't even know the times yet. So Tiamir, do we have any details on the project booth? I don't know. I got an email a couple of days ago and I still need to go through it. Can I send it to you later today? I'm so sorry. I, I'm slacking on that. But the way I understood it is to say that we don't have to be there the entire time because it's pretty much the whole day. And the way I understood it is we can also just play videos. Like that's why I kind of went this weekend and created some videos. I'll try to create some more over the week. Uh, just not because I feel like, you know, they're you, you, more, mostly for this, because then we can send them links and maybe we can just loop, you know, a couple of videos and in the hours where nobody can be there, uh, that can be shown, you know, to, 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 to people interested. Mm -hmm. um, but have you been to booths? Uh, KubeCon never have, I've never then done that. So this is news for me too. Um, that there was, was a red... There was a yeah. Red Hat booth, right? Um, no, uh, what I was with Red Hat last time was similar to what we did for the project office hours. But basically, it was just a Red Hat uh, chat channel. And you can just, and it felt weird to me because it's almost like a resume. You have to say, oh, I'm a developer at so and so, I'm working on this and that. And then whoever is interested can ask you questions or ping you. And, I didn't feel like advertising myself there because I'm just not into that. Um, but this project booth, it seems that it's more restrictive. Whereas, like I just said, in the in the project office hours, we can say who we are, who we work for, what we're planning to do for this booth. They said specifically, we cannot uh, like do any sales pitches or any of that type of deal or they will pretty much kick us out forever so that's why i was kind of like any idea on what we can do except like loop videos and just be there to answer questions i'm all ears i think i've only seen one or two booths uh, last time connectivity to the intrado website was really bad so um but i i saw yeah a video showing like the center piece of the web page and that may have changed. I've only seen uh, one or two videos, but I think that was a main advertisement for uh, the companies. And um, they had a Twitter feed going underneath and a button where you could click if you wanted to talk to someone. Uh, I think that's all there is. Or do you know if there is any chat that we have to stuff yeah they said they will give us the way i understood it there is a specific website for this where you can see chat i still can't log into it I, I, they said if you can log in after two three days to send out a help email so i'm doing that now and because it does require a pass to kubecon they will give us five passes for our team since we're doing it but i just need to log in and then enter in the email addresses of for people that are interested in doing this. 
so they can get a pass just for that. Uh, that's as far as I understand. I'm still getting there. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, so I need to be able to log in right now. They only gave me a pass and then uh, I need to add five members of the said from the team. So if you want to, you know, have the ability, you don't, it's not, it's all free, I guess, if you have time, if you don't have time, that's all there. But if you want to be able to join and, 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 and uh, participate, please, you know, send me a private, maybe your email address or something. Okay. Then I guess we'd be uh, setting up all the links to um, specification SDKs, a uh, little bit of overview, loop the videos that we have. I think we should probably ping Doug for the recording of our last community call two weeks ago, if it's not already on YouTube, uh, and cut out our deep dive. If you're okay with that, Timia? Yeah, the only thing I don't know is there is a record button on this thing. I never press it. So maybe we never record our meetings. I have no clue. Oh, no, no, it's, it's always recording and you need permission by um, the channel admin or, or administrator or host. But the host, I think, is Doug. So, um, or the CNCF. This is, it's, uh, it's always recording, the Zoom channel. Yeah. But uh, for for you mean for the uh, office hours? Are you saying? No, for, uh, no, no. For, uh, for office hours, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. Um, to get videos together for our project booths, I was thinking about also using the recording of our last deep dive two weeks ago. Yeah, we can also such a send you if you wish uh, the introduction slides I have that we did last time. Um, so anybody could present those if they would like to. Um, and yeah, those can be useful too, because I also think like, I agree with you last time we did this. I think a lot of people came in just wanting to learn what this is that we're doing more so than hearing about some internal discussions, about some specific feature that might be over their head. Um, so having some sort of introduction at the beginning, I think is useful if you guys agree. Yep. Yeah. And and I'm still not done with slides for any of these talks yet. So I'll have them no, here, don't worry. <laughs> but we have a ton of slides and I'll I'll you know I'll send them to you. Um, yeah, no problem. Oh, yeah, I, I wanted to highlight just this one because still um, the cloud events um, Doug and Clements, they are sort of a, where we came from. Uh, <laughs> please add them to your schedule. And then we have uh, Tiomir and Ricardo giving a talk on serverless workflow. Uh, here's the link to the sketch. You can add it to your calendar. And um, also the serverless working group lets us uh, present serverless workflow again. And yeah, I think that's that's settled, right? Tiomir, you're going to do that with Doug. Oh. Yeah, and, and okay, cool. that's really nice of them, man. They don't, don't have to do that, but they're, Doug is nice to allow us to talk. To them. Yeah, I noticed this year or this time there will be no practitioner summit. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, it's pretty much it. Should we? Uh, this uh, would also be talks that we may want to highlight at our project booth. I haven't checked, Jürgen or Kay, do you have any talks uh, at KubeCon? Anything that you want highlighted? No, no, we, uh, we don't. Okay. Then uh, next topic is, um, oh yeah. Ooh. I put it here, I wasn't sure if I, we should bring it up. Um, so Red Hat Community Central uh, wants to yeah, showcase, highlight, or take an interview on the serverless workflow. So we might have additional advertisement there, if possible. And 
yeah, that's about it. Uh, we do have, I didn't copy them over, but we do have um, from our second last community call, we had the discussion about the release and when to do that. And this is approaching fast. So our next community call, I just wanted to um, remind that in two weeks, we might want to branch out and freeze with what we currently have and then give two weeks for uh, bug fixing, proofreading, and so on to do the formal release of 1.0. Okay. Which brings us back to our current work. So pull requests, this is a big one, right? This is the open API, and I think there was lots of discussion on it. Yep. Let me check if you have anything else before we go into the um, PRs and issues, then please let me know. Okay. So I think we might even be able to do a decision on this one. Uh, there were a few changes uh, within the last 24 hours, but I think that was only a small change. Ooh, how long is this thing? Okay, yeah. It's quite a good discussion. I really enjoyed it. So in the meantime, last week, Monday, we had a call with Alex. Um, it was very interesting. Um, I think everybody was on the call, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Spare the time. So how do we go on about this uh, open API? Do we want more time on this? Are we good to... Uh, take it over as it is now. So, Tiamir, I didn't get a chance to review the latest changes. Can you just give a brief overview? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I Basically, I... Mm. Uh, yeah, but to answer Manuel's first question, no, I think uh, Jürgen needs to... Uh, we need to come to an agreement. Uh, I don't think I can push uh, these changes or we should push these changes without him. Um, being okay with it uh, because he's been very involved in this uh, from the start and has some very good ideas. The basic thing is that we have to make a decision and and this decision I, I believe is pretty big. I think functions right now, not to bring all the our last talk back up, are an important part to fix for 1.0. So in my opinion, this is a little bit holding up uh, the 1.0 milestone, whatever one, I guess, release. Um, because it, it's important. Um, and just the changes that I had to answer your question is, I, I really try to describe exactly that we, we are able to describe everything with our function definition. So if, so if you have service that you want to invoke, that you know where it lives, and you have information about uh, where the runtime needs to go to invoke it, you can use the function definitions. But the only thing that we can um, we can, um, how do you say, confirm that is probably portable across different runtimes as far as the markup goes is the use of open API definition. So we're offloading that part off. If you decide to use a, a custom, inf uh, define custom information within the markup in the function definition specifically, we cannot, this is specification guaranteed that your workflow definition might work on a different runtime implementation. So that's really all I kind of tried in my best English to, to write down uh, and also put, provide more examples of how to use the metadata section to have a free form um, definition that makes more sense for people that they, they, don't, they don't want to or don't have their uh, services exposed via REST. Now, still the specification allows, as we talked about, uh, and also open a different PR that we will look at that I think is also very interesting uh, for event-based uh, invocation of services, we handle that separately. So this only is really the function definitions uh, for services that we know uh, how to invoke uh, specifically, not for things triggered by events. But, yeah. That distinction seems a little bit confusing to me. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess 
yeah. as a as a user of a workflow, I feel like I'm invoking something, whether it be event or via event or or by you know uh, an HTTP call, right? But I'm I'm invoking something and waiting for it to complete and getting a result back in some fashion, right? So it, like to 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 define those two different ways of invoking something differently is seems confusing to me. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, it, it's, it's kind of confusing in general because this is not a feature that other markups for workflows, not, like you won't find this in AWS or Google or Alibaba, I believe, but they're not here to tell me wrong so I can say what I want. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the difference is, is that what we have event definition to describe events, they're either consumed or produced. And we can already produce um, events in transitions, uh, at workflow end definitions, um, and things like that. Uh, the same approach we're taking for actions where we say, look, I want to produce an event, but in order to produce an event, we need to keep it consistent by just referencing it. We reference uh, an event definition in transitions. We reference an event tr uh, definition on the end definition to produce an event. So in order to keep it consistent, the actions do the same. Uh, function definition does not mean um, execution of a service. It just means a description or invocation of something that we want to invoke. But the actual action itself, we divided it. And, and from the market perspective, I'm not arguing with you, Jurgen. I think there could be improvement there in order to make it specific. But I'm just saying like the idea of actually moving that uh, into a function definition itself, that's what I'm kind of like, I don't know about that. You well, know? so the, um, uh, maybe, I mean, what, what I had imagined it would be a function that would reference to event, like basically look the same as the events, uh, I can't remember what it's called in the actions section, but um, you know, it's still reference to events. It wouldn't be like defining them in line in the function, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's a good idea. The only thing that I have issue, like not to have an issue with, but maybe more, more I'm asking is, does it really fit in there? Because sending out an event can really trigger uh, a set of services. So it wouldn't be a function definition, it would be, a, or a service definition. Whereas in a function, each uh, of the definitions in the functions array really represent a single service in its operation. Whereas triggering an event can actually invoke invocation of 15, 20, 100 services. And they might not be even services, it might be other you know, workflows, it might be triggering whatever, you know, is actually listening for this types of event. Uh, it can even trigger an Argo workflow or trigger a pipeline execution in this case. Yeah. So that, that is why my confusion is like, if we add that in there, are we confusing people as far as what a function definition means? Uh, and, and, and so we can definitely talk about it. I think that's a, that's a very good, uh, uh, what, you know, and I, I agree in some way, may, maybe finding a way to kind of put this together makes sense. Um, but how, <laughs> you know, let's, maybe we can do some examples and, and, and talk about it. Yeah, you're... I'd like to explore that. I, I think there's ways to make it, you know, I think as a, as a consumer of a workflow, I just want to, whether it's you know a whole thing, slew of services that listen for that event and respond, or it's one thing, I'm still kind of trying to kick off, invoke something, right? And so I don't really want to know the details. I just want to know that how to invoke it and what to wait for at the end, right? So it's, yeah. you know, it seems like that's easier for people to think about if it just feels like I'm invoking something. I, I'd I'd love to explore it more. Um, you know, like we can go through some examples maybe, um, just to kick around the idea and that in that um, issue that I filed. Is that what you're thinking? Sorry, I didn't hear the last thing. Um, I, th I think the last thing you said is maybe we can go through some examples and, and yeah, discuss yeah. them. That's I think the best approach. One of the things I found was like once we started actually doing examples and seeing the JSON or the YAML, then it kind of clicks, you know? <laughs> and yeah. it's like, wow, this is too verbose or oh, wow, this makes actually no sense whatsoever. And having these types of iterations, I think would really help to nail this down to be better than what it is now. And, and I, I agree, it's not perfect, 
but at the same time, it's not bad either. So yeah, yeah helps yeah. to improve. Too. So so let's keep this PR open. And what do you think until we we or should this discussion about actions be separate? Well, it seems to me like this is a. I mean, it seems like we can resolve this PR, and then you know. To do a separate discussion about the the actions thing, and you know maybe that changes this PR a little bit, but it doesn't seem like we should block this PR for that, right? Yeah, thank you, and and I think also for KubeCon, you know, having like this little bang of a milestone one release, I think would be very beneficial, and knowing that yes, we're not perfect, and yes, we've got tons of improvements to make in the near and far future. And it will do it in the in the milestones to come. Is that something that is okay, also, Jurgen? Um, I don't like. I guess I've never thought about that, so I I don't know what the <laughs> I have. My, <laughs> my, my feedback around that would be: uh, Does it need to be 1.0? Uh, for example, like the questions I am asking myself is: What is the in the CNCF community? What is the general perception? if you need to do a breaking change from 1.0, right? Uh, and then the second question I'm asking myself is like, should it be 1.0 or like uh, another milestone that is less than 1.0? Like, are we, what are we trying to convey with 1.0? Are we saying we're very stable? You're not gonna get much changes to the spec after this? Or are we saying there's gonna be still many changes? So I think those are the two questions we need to answer. Yeah. And they're all valid questions and I get it. But the problem, we've been around like, we, we have been just accepted what in June or July for Sandbox project. And and one of the things maybe that is a, that I wanted to convey with this is more PR move, more than anything. We know that we need a lot of improvement. We have been doing improvements for a long time now, but still a lot is to come. And, and this is where you know you guys come in and, and everybody from the community. So the point of improvement, continuous improvement is always going to be there. As far as stability goes, my question goes back is like, when do we say we're stable? At some, if I look at other workflows, like what we discussed in last meeting and, and all the other ones, we're already a superset of all, pretty much everything that, I, that is out there, if I'm not mistaken. So there is, in my opinion, what I wanted to fix is this function definitions to kind of clarify that from the perspective of, of being a little bit more stable than what we were with some custom definitions before. And another big part of, and Jurgen is helping me out with that as well with his issues, is the error handling and the retries. That section really needs to be improved. And I've been kind of trying to get that done whenever I can, but haven't been successful yet to finish. So the only thing for KubeCon now is we have to figure out uh, because we already had talks at last KubeCon, we were 0 0.2. Uh, now, if we are still 0 0.2, that might look a little bit like we're not doing anything or not doing any incremental improvements. Basically, the only thing is, question is, how do we, how do we show people that we are continuously moving forward, but at the same time, keeping this notion that you're saying is, hey, are we stable? Can we be used? Because quite frankly, I, I, we already work, I've been working on two runtimes now for this, both Java-based and it works, you know? So what does stable really mean? I don't know. Uh, it's more of a decision by our team than I think the perception of anything else. I don't know. Got it. No, no, definitely. I, I get the PR perspective and uh, the need to show that we're making progress. The only, uh, the, yeah, that's the question I have is it, should it be 0 0.3, 0 0.5 or straight 1.0, right? Yeah, and not like, really clear as long as I can say in a, in a uh, like when we introduce our specification, we can say, hey, we just released uh, version X point Y and I really don't care what it is. Uh, honestly, as long as, um, as long as there is something that we can say, you know? Because the, the bigger problem also, and also Manuel, you know this, our 0 0.2 uh, release is actually in our old GitHub repository. So in the current one that we are at, we actually have no releases yet. And that would also help with that where we can actually remove the 0 0.2 completely uh, because it really is kind of like, we have done so many improvements after that. I don't think it's even relevant that there is no runtime or anybody actually using that old version. 
Um, may, not remove it, but maybe just push it somewhere where it's kind of hidden maybe a little bit because we don't want people to go to the old repository, you know? Um, and, and to just have a, a, a release on ours, which you, before we also only had a <laughs> release of the specification schemas, but now we also have the Java SDK, the Go uh, SDK, the Visual Studio Code plugin, and all of those places, we, if once we do a release, we can say, hey, everything kind of works together. Everything supports currently this version. And then we'll move everything again forward to the next one as we improve. Yep. So there are several definitions of what a 1.0 release marks. Um, uh, one I found was that people think it's sort of um, complete in a way that it has all the aspects covered. It's not like in perfect, but in, in completeness and that it is usable. And I think we are already past mm -hmm. this um, usable. So I'm okay with going to higher versions. But it's also different teams um, develop different cultures. If you take Canadian, for example, they are still in the zero dot, um, but they are being used a lot in, in other projects. So I really think if we, if we do a major release here, uh, that's something where you can then later safely do implementation on SDKs. Um, of course, until the next major release, but for a while this will be uh, the the standard being used in implementations, and then whatever the next release brings uh, can be rolled out out at a later stage. So having this um, state captured in a major release version, uh, to me it makes sense. I personally, in, when I started, I had doubts about everything, like if states uh, should be the right thing to use, you know, other projects use like um, tasks, pipelines, uh, they originate from CICD pipelines and so on. There are direct acyclic graphs and all sorts of things. And um, whether we should really have these states was unclear to me, but uh, now that we have also covered the, uh, how to invoke a function for the first time, we have uh, somehow settled on uh, this, this HTTP binding being something that we would want to see supported. Uh, we have the JSON and YAML uh, formats for everything. And um, we have cloud events, uh, not just saying like, oh yeah, it will be cloud events someday, but actually using cloud events in the specification. To me, that's pretty good. Pretty good state right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and in addition, you know, with the addition of the SDKs and the Visual Studio Code plug, it's all specification based and that's important. You don't have to go out and download some, you know, company's extension in order to use it. You, you download the serverless workload specification extension, you know, and, and I think we're getting somewhere. It's just growing the community and actually changing our processes, giving the number of people, you know, that we have. And, and I hope one day we will, you know, become like where we get like cloud events, 50 people in a meeting and we have takes like a month to do a single PR. I would love that as well, you know, and, uh, uh, but it is what it is at this time. And we just have to push forward. And I think we have the ability with a smaller community and people, you know, great people like on this call and, and, and the others that are joining to, to, to really do something about this. But yeah, please, you know, keep patient uh, uh, with us and, and, and just, you know, let's see if we can together move this forward because at the end, I think we will all have success, some sort of success with it, I hope. Let's see. About this function ref and event ref, um, yeah, maybe we can speed things up a little. I, so, the one thing is uh, whether we allow the PR now or keep working on the PR and um, merge it later, or if we merge it now and then make an additional PR on top of it. I'm very much in favor actually of collapsing event ref and function ref into just function ref, because the way event ref is specified now with the trigger and result, that's an, a message going out and a message coming in. Um, very much like a function call. So in a function call, you also only know the function signature, you know what to send out. Uh, the event specification, like the event type also tells you what to send out. So in that case, the trigger and making the function call is similar. 
And what you get back is, um, sure, in a swagger definition would be defined uh, what you what it carries in the body as your result. And here it would be the event type that also declares um, what you can expect in the result. So in a way, they're very similar. Also, um, what I personally see is maybe I want to tweet uh, for or for not found as a good case, not as an error. So maybe there is even more than one possible result in here. Um, and having this as a function definition really makes sense to me. But it, it also tidies up the actions, right? You only need the function reference and uh, don't have these complicated rules of if there is a function reference in there or uh, an event reference in there. I agree. Yeah. Those are good points. I think those are good points. It seems like um, maybe uh, since Tiomir, you wanted me to um, you wanted to get my input on the PR. Um, maybe give me a chance to look at that, and I can add a comment. You know, I, I just want to look through it real quick, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's all good, and we can close that, and then we can move on to um, you know discuss more of this events and function thing in the in the issue for that. No, I'm perfectly okay. And also, if you don't mind, I will need your help uh, uh, with the other issues that we will take. You, you have open, especially around um, the retries and the air handling. I think that that will be huge if you can help me out with that. Um, sure. What do you mean by help? Like, uh, I, I, I just uh, nothing. I don't expect uh, just uh, comments. On, I will do some PRs, link them to your issues. Oh, that's the general yeah. discussion to make sure that that we're going in a good direction with with what you because a lot of the stuff you seem kind of like to know a lot more than me about this so you know I, just looking over the prs and, and telling me hey no <laughs> you know sure. yeah so, um i would love to take a look at that i'll i'll, I'll um, keep an eye out for those and review them as soon as i see them thanks i appreciate you uh, integrating the feedback yeah, man. Any time. Okay, cool. Should we go to the first of those issues? Or is it in the right order? No, there's another one. I don't. So, sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's the issue that we. Oh, that's the one we already dis we just discussed. Yeah. So in the next, uh, logically, yeah. JSON patch uh, schema. Yeah. Ricardo found a standard called JSON patch. Uh, which allows you to I think, define commands on how to uh, change the JSON data since all our states uh, that or the workload data is in JSON. He said it would be a nice thing to use a standard instead of defining some custom uh, modifications of, of the data using some other languages, which makes sense. Uh, we just, I just asked him to maybe provide specific examples um, to see where he would like to see that uh, fit. And we'll move that forward now. I don't know much about JSON patch. Um, the thing that worries me about, like it sounds sounds cool, but hopefully it's not Turing complete, is it? I don't know much. I need to look, honestly. <laughs> but I just wanted to kind of, yeah, see what, yeah. what his idea was and go from there. Uh, one thing I know for sure is that customize can be really a pain, especially the, uh, using JSON patches, but maybe that's sort of their adoption of the RFC. The RFC is sound, it's, uh, it needs a little, you need a little bit of experience with it until you can use it in production, but um, yeah. So all data we handle, workflow data, um, that we juggle uh, in, in states, uh, they should all be JSON addressable. Or do, don't we have the uh, also the, the YAML format? Um, the data itself is always JSON. And, and what he's kind of talking about, I've, I run into it, and, and if you guys have just a minute to just explain the issue itself is on the runtime implementations. For example, our inject state, you have state data uh, and the inject state gives you a JSON object, which then you have to merge with the state data. The same thing is really also on all our um, data formatting. Um, we get a, 
uh, response from a function call or, or an event that comes in has its uh, payload. And we have to take this payload and do something with it in order to merge it with the state data itself. And JSON patch, what it helps in there is right now, the way I have to do it, I have to basically use either the, the underlying, in my case, Java JSON uh, APIs in order to merge stuff together. And it's kind of complicated at times. JSON patch would allow me to simply write instructions like add, remove, update, merge, and boom, it's done. So this really would help the runtime implementations if we had this or define them. And, and that's kind of, I think, where he's getting it. So it really, from the market perspective, I don't really see where it fits yet, but that problem does exist if you do, guys are running into, uh, writing your runtime inputs. Yeah, I know that we usually use a JSON pass to um, define where we want the, a result of a, a function to end up. Um, this add delete um, operations in JSON patch, uh, I, I, they can be used as a script to make more complex modifications of a, of a JSON structure. And I'm, I'm wondering if that is sound in, in the markup that we're using. So it, it might blow up um, our workflow definition a little. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, let's have just, to think about let's, it. Yeah, maybe let's, let's yeah. wait for Ricardo to maybe give an example of what he thinks, uh, how this should be used. Because if I have a, a JSON patch uh, document within our, um, workflow definition to define uh, which of uh, which data should go where in the in the document that's kind of complicated but yeah okay, okay. Um, then the next one uniqueness constraint for workflows oh, it's a little longer. Would you like to discuss a little bit about this or? Yeah, you're working, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, so the background on this is that um, I think a common feature for people who want to implement workflows is they want kind of a logical single instance. Like say I've got a compute resources I want to repair. I don't want to run that repair job three times. I want to run it once. And if the workflow um, engine can enforce that uniqueness, it makes things easier for uh, people using workflows. And um, I see a parallel in, of this in the event correlation. Um, I can actually accomplish this with event um, triggered workflows because the correlation rules, um, as far as I understand them, uh, allow for this. But it doesn't work well for um, directly invoked workflows and it doesn't, or it doesn't, that doesn't exist for directly invoked workflows and it doesn't exist for the like cron scheduled workflows. And so, um, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how, if there's a way that we could get that um, uniqueness constraint that we have for event invoked workflows to work for the other two. So um, maybe that means I don't know exactly what that means um, in terms because I'm still you know getting familiar with the spec, but um, in my mind, you know that means something about like changing the way the correlation rules work or making them like pulling that up a level so that it applies to all three of those or um, you know there's more of a hey, this is a really useful feature in a workflow engine and asking you know for ideas on how we could what we could propose. I'm just going to let you know, even the BPMN guys will don't have this and they've been around for a decade. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is very interesting and I, I think we should definitely explore it further. Mm -hmm. If we get it, if we nail it down, I think, like you said, it is very, very good to have. Because yeah. like another thing to look at is like, like AWS, for example, has uh, an ad additional information you can give to workflows, even like restrictions on what region can execute it or what region can even execute to a task within a workflow, uh, user restrictions, 
based on roles and, and blah, blah, blah. We don't have that currently. So this is important start uh, to start introducing not only the markup as far as the logical execution goes, but also in addition, uh, provide runtime some information. Because in the end, uh, what you're saying, what we have to be concerned of and kind of careful is that we allow users to solve business problems at the end. And yeah. I, at the beginning, I didn't get your, uh, your idea, but then, then I thought about it and I said, being able to execute a workflow only once, it's actually a business decision. It's not a runtime implementation decision. You as right. a modeler have uh, the ability to say, hey, I'm writing this to only be executed once. And it, it might be an important part of a business solution. So definitely something that we need to to to, right. to add yeah. across. Like if you imagine going from one runtime that does support this uniqueness and going to another, I would have to rewrite my workflows to do, you know, potentially do that kind of constraint on their own in their business logic or something, right? So it wouldn't my my if one runtime supports it and others don't, um, you know, it's it, that's vendor lock in right there, right? Which is you know, I, I think it's a big part of workflow execution, like you're saying. Yeah, and and and, and addressing uh, the 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 cloud events uh, correlation rules, I think it's we if we can go with that approach to define correlation rules, maybe between uh, workflows and, and 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 states within the workflows. I think that would maybe that's the right approach right now. But yeah, let's let's move this forward and 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 add to it as as we have ideas. Okay. Okay, um, so maybe I'll, uh, I'll think of some suggestions on ideas and, and just kind of throw out some ideas and we can go from there or what do you think on the, on the issue? Okay. Yes, we, st we still have the event state, right? That uh, sort of waits for an event to trigger the workflow or to consume an event and then we have the ability to kick off an event with anything that is part of the event definitions uh, consumed by the workflow as per the uh, what is it the workflow uh, event definitions but one thing i was wondering the correlation token we're currently using using that's something um that's in any payload that triggers a workflow, right? And doesn't this, the spec say that if that token is the same, we should end up in the same workflow instance? Yeah, that, that's event. And I think Jurgen is looking for like um, cron job triggered workflow. So anything like that doesn't have, that doesn't have an event. I think we covered like cloud events allows us to cover that part with correlation on the, uh, on the events and, and their context uh, properties. But if we're just starting a workflow without an event, I think Jurgen is trying to figure out how to correlate uh, these types of workflow instances, especially like what he said with the, with the cron job execution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very interesting point indeed, definitely. Yeah, and the events thing makes it kind of tricky because it's like just moving the correlation rules up a level seems to confuse the events side of it and the way that use case works now. So I, I couldn't I couldn't figure out a good suggestion that worked out real well there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. it, don't be afraid to suggest something that would uh, even uh, change the spec. So far, we're not looking for backward compatibility. If that's the better way or unifying things uh, for the workflow, that's it's also an option. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try to um, just kind of propose some ideas and point out where it causes problems with existing stuff, and maybe we can run from there. That's great. I, I haven't actually thought about it because I only uh, consider, consider the event triggered uh, workflows. <laughs> so very good, very, very good point. Cool. Then I'll move on to the next one. So retries, oh yeah, that's a long, that's a long standing thing. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to put it in there to sh tell you that hey, I'm looking at this. <laughs> Don't <laughs> didn't forget about you. you know? No problem. But just overall, Manuel, the the the, the thing that um, one of the sections that we really need to approve it. I mean kind of trying to do it myself, but now with Jurgen's comments, it's gotten bigger than what initially is the air handling. Uh, this is one section which hasn't gotten a lot of improvements over the last time since we kind of took this project or moved it, start moving it forward. And, and that's part of it. Um, so just to kind of put it in context. Yeah, one way to look at it from um, protocol design is also like when you take, for example, the the TCP stack um, for something where you cannot even reach your counterpart, the connect failing. What you get is a specified response. So to the application level, it looks like it it's getting a response even though um, the call wasn't even made. So for functions and error handling, what we, we could look at this similarly saying that uh, we do make the function call, but not being able to locate uh, the function endpoint or instance uh, could be sort of a response um, to the application that is to our workflow engine um, if we want to design it that way. And then the user can decide uh, whether to use that even as in a good weather case, like I, before when I mentioned the 404 not, find, not found, maybe that's a, an expected response. Um, or to, yeah, having a non-treated uh, response, which throws uh, general exception or means we have a default error handling um, or specified error handling. So yeah, okay. That's actually, uh, especially the 404, if you think about workflows needing to be, um, generally when you design workflows, they need to be very item potent. And so if I'm deleting resources, 404 is a response I have to handle as success in the delete case, because I might've already tried to delete and succeeded, but I didn't get a, I got a network error back instead of a success, right? So my next attempt would be a 404 and that should be a success. Um, why do I have it twice? This is 137 and this is 136. They're uh, somewhat similar, uh, both related to a similar area. Okay. All right. Or actually, there's, where is the number? All right. So, actually, these are exactly the same? Wait. Did I paste the link twice? I'm sorry. No, that's about exponential backup, on, backup yeah. only. And I think that came after the max attempts and interval attributes is about um, yeah. how to specify these intervals. And uh, if it was a uh, one shot time, so to say, then yeah. I think about how to interpret uh, this with respect to the workflow uh, activation. So yeah, okay, these these two are ongoing. <laughs> um, cool. Perfect. Okay, wow, that hour went fast. We are almost up to the hour. Um, Nobody else has joined in the meantime. Um, so the issues aren't going. Any, any final words? Anybody want to say anything on this? Should I make any notes on any of the issues? Uh, <laughs> give action items. Okay, then uh, let's definitely move on uh, this one, the open API spec and uh, 
collect a few examples or follow up on, on the PR. Um, yeah, and that's it. So any other business? No, then thank you very much for your participation. That was really good. And uh, we would have uh, our next one in two weeks where we might also want to decide on a feature freeze and branch out uh, for the next version's release candidate. Um, should we should we have another uh, call next Monday? Yes, please. And let's make the decision because it'll take me a while to do that. <laughs> you know, it's not like it just happened. And yeah, there's a ton of crap going on right now with demos and slides and God knows what. That's everybody else. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, anybody in favor or against having it next uh, another call in between? Because uh, our next call would be in two weeks, and that's already our second last before KubeCon. Um, so the idea is, my idea would be to have another another call next Monday, uh, same time because that seems to work. Uh, but if anybody, I'm flex, I'm very flexible on the timing. If you have any preferences, we could also move it. Seems reasonable to me. Uh, you know, just so uh, chat wise, we can follow up on what we just discussed, and um, next time, this time next Monday works for me. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Then uh, read you later and see you next Monday. Thanks, you guys. See ya. Thanks. Bye.